Hey, welcome back to the Today Dreamer podcast, where through conversational space, we explore ways to cultivate the practice of presence in our lives so that we can better participate in the emergent world story. So, if you're interested in helping that world story blossom, then you're in the right place. And today's guest is all about stories and is all about mythology. So, Michael Mead is a renowned storyteller, author, and scholar of mythology, anthropology, and psychology. He combines hypnotic storytelling, street savvy perceptiveness, and spellbinding interpretations of ancient myths with a deep knowledge of cross cultural rituals. So, we'll be talking about mythology, we'll be talking about the current state of emergent chaos, um, birth, and rebirth. And where we may be as a collective, according to Michael's beautiful, um, deep wisdom when it comes to mythology um, and the stories that have been around since ancient times from a multitude of different cultures. So we're going to be having interesting explorations, that's for sure. Uh, But before we get into things, I would just quickly like to say that I am offering one-on-ones so if you're someone that's interested with um, in a spiritual friend or someone to kind of help you through a transformational space in your life or a passage that you might be moving into then please head over to todaydreamer.com and we'll see if we can embark on that journey together developing our state of presence along the way and yeah, I've developed a bit of a structural course um, that I'm looking forward to leading people through. So if you're someone that's interested in that, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Also, if you haven't had a chance yet and you're enjoying the episodes, please take a moment to leave a review. I think I've only got like seven reviews on Apple Podcasts. I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, little, it's a weird thing talking about this asking for likes, comments, and subscribes, and reviews. I don't know, if it feels right, leave a review and a comment, because it helps. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So, before we move into the conversation with Michael, it might be really nice to do what we usually do, and just take a slow and deep breath together, giving us a chance to kind of pause wherever we might be in our day, in our minds, and in our hearts. So I invite you now, you special being out there listening, to gently close your eyes. And just take your time with the slow and graceful inhalation through the nose. And whenever it is that you get to the peak of that inhalation, feel free to pause for a moment and notice the subtleties of your experience before releasing any tension and exhaling just as gracefully on the way out. Take your time opening your eyes you might like to, to synchronize your next out breath with the gentle opening of your eyelids staying connected with the breath and with the subtleties of your experience as your day and this podcast continues to unfold In modern culture, the word myth has morphed to mean something false. People say it's just a myth. Mm -hmm. Whereas one of the meanings of myth is emergent truth. So some of the truths that people can't find in the literal world, even in the psychological world, are waiting to be found in myth. Um, Myth is not about the facts of the matter, it's about the facts of life. 
So what really matters is connected to myth. Um, another way to talk about myth is to say that the Greek word muthos, from which we get the English word myth, um, uh, means uh, story. It means both to know the story and to tell the story can have either meaning. And so stories um, and narrative intelligence, you could say, are the essential mode of humans. Um, relate, as in relationship, comes from a Latin verb, relatare, which means to carry it back. So a relationship is really based on what we carry back to each other in the relationship. And you know, you know what I mean? If some, someone isn't carrying back to their partner um, or their partners, whatever it is, uh, the story that's happening to them, the relationship becomes less intimate and less meaningful. And mm -hmm. so stories are how we relate to each other. And stories are how we relate to the world and the condition of the world. And so um, it used to be better understood that myth makes meaning, that myth adds levels of meaning that people cannot get from the facts. Of course, the facts aren't even believed now anyway. So it's all the more reason to go to myth, but, but um, so that's another old idea. Myth makes meaning. So a person can have all kinds of experiences. It doesn't mean they learned anything. If those experiences are, are converted into a story, and if that story is related to a mythic type story, then all of a sudden meaning begins to flow. So mm -hmm. I'll give a simple example. Most people know the myth of Icarus who flew too high, got too close to the sun and the wax holding on his wings melted and he fell all the way into the sea. So that's a mythic story. It's, was there a myth, uh, uh, an actual character, Icarus, who flew near the sun? Probably not. In other words, a myth is a series of lies that reveals the truth. So even though there probably was no Icarus in history, the story of Icarus has been living for thousands of years. It still applies right now. If someone rises too fast, too high, let's say they become famous because they're on internet or on, they become viral, they're likely to fall just as hard and just as fast. And that's the myth of Icarus. And so if a person is going through rising and falling, it'd be really helpful to know the myth of Icarus. So on the way up, you can go, aha, if I get too high, I'm probably gonna fall harder down. And suddenly you're getting meaning out of both rising in life and falling in life. Yeah. Uh, it yeah, it seems to me that you you know quite a few stories and you know the roots of quite a few words. So I think that together is like a real wealth of of kind of wisdom to be, you know, passing back like you mentioned. And this this idea of you know uh, stories connecting to the human psyche and having them flow from that space throughout time and then having I'm not sure but I'm sure you've you've I'm sure you have realized that the patterns within the different myths from different places and different times. And even now you just mentioned that there's a way that we can kind of connect our own story once we're, once we're able to kind of step back and observe what that may be and see where things might be heading or derive some lessons from these ancient tales. And yeah, have yeah. you, and, and it, we've got, you know, the internet these days. So there's an access point to, like looking into myths and seeing how they may be able to inform our lives. And yeah, you, the, can, you can get the information more easily. That's true. Yeah. yeah. You can study all the myths in the world online. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a beautiful thing. How it just start the idea of how these stories have been passed throughout time over and over again. And they've probably informed many people's lives. And although, like you mentioned, it, it may be seen from one perspective as, you know, lies that lead to a sense of deeper truth. Um, it's still in kind of, it can, it has the power to inform the way that we live in a really meaningful way. So there's an old um, challenge, which is uh, twofold. There's always two stories going on in the world. One is the story, the ongoing drama of the world. 
and the other is the individual drama of human life. Those are the two stories. They're secretly connected. The more connected they are, the more the human understands the world. Um, but so inside the dynamic of those two stories, one of the question, the key questions become, do you know what story you're in? Do you know what myth you're in? So since we're now in a period where global issues are known that most everyone knows there's a climate crisis. Most everyone knows there's a COVID crisis. I mean, I know there's people that don't believe that, but they're kind of in the story as not believers. They're not out of the story, they're in the story. And so, and most people know that there's a crisis of truth and meaning. Um, and so what story are you in when all of that is happening? What story are we in when we know we're in trouble together? Um, and so there's an answer on a mythic level and, and the simplest answer or the most direct one is the myth of apocalypse, which is another old Greek word, which doesn't mean the fiery end of everything. It actually has a, a couple of meanings. One meaning of apocalypse or the Greek word is apocalypsis is a lifting of the veil, which means things that are usually hidden are now seen. So that's a way to look at what's happening in the world as many more um, radical things are out in the open. People say out in the open things that used to be said behind closed doors. So that's the lifting of the veil. But the greater meaning of apocalypse is, and there's many myths about it, but as a mythic theme, it means collapse renewal. So one way to understand what's going on now for all of us, because uh, due to the scope of issues right now, which are global, and due to what you were mentioning about the internet, which is almost everybody knows what's going on, which wasn't always the case, um, people could realize that we are in this mythic dynamic of collapse and renewal. Now, most everybody knows we're in collapse. You can get people to just tell the story of how things, the health system is falling apart, that this, the distribution network is falling apart, the educational, you know, collapse is all over the place. What most people don't know is the other half of the myth is renewal. It's collapse and renewal. And it isn't even collapse and then renewal. Secretly, renewal is happening at the same time as the collapse. So to me, that's a tremendous piece of knowledge. That is to say, each of us has the opportunity to figure out what part of renewal are we connected to? We're all witnesses of the collapse. You have to really hide nowadays not to know that things are falling apart. But then when you go back to the human story, each person is innately connected to an area of life where they have something meaningful to contribute and so if we can figure out what, what that connection is, what we came to life to give, or what gifts we naturally have that make us more able to continue contribute to a renewal, all of a sudden being alive at the time of collapse has a very positive counterpart, which is if I could follow my own genius, then I'm in a position in the midst of the collapse to continue contribute to the renewal that's also going to happen. Yeah, it seems like a different type of seeing is needed in this space. Um, yeah. And what comes to mind is even just, you know, the idea of mosaic voices. Now you're saying this, it's making a lot more sense, you know, a coming together of these unique um, beings in their own different way and whichever way feels more, um, like they're seeing from this inner place and it feels the most right to them from a place of contribution and participation. And that yeah. adds to the kind of collective emergence of this continuous story. And I just guess what's coming up for me is this idea of dancing in this space of the unknown and looking to things like myths to maybe cast a, a fraction of light onto what is going on and, and what you know, almost like as a sense of maybe um, encouragement or, um, you know, 
I guess trust needs to come from within, but it's always nice having little signifiers on the way to show you that you're on the right path. Well, I want to pick up the image that you had, because to me it was an image of dancing in the middle of the collapse. So there's uh, a myth from a small tribe in South America. Um, the story is usually called Ikanchu's drum. Ikanchu is a character in the myth of this not very big tribe. And the, the story is kind of complicated, but the essence of it is something goes wrong. And not only does the planet overheat, it goes on fire. And everything is turned to ash, everything, forests, animals, humans, everything is burned to ash. And there's only two characters that aren't caught in this kind of uh, incineration uh, of Earth, Ikanchu and, and his partner. Um, What's the, I forget the name, because the, the partner never speaks. Mm. So the partner of Ikanchu is the witness to everything that happens. And anybody that knows the Hindu myths of ancient India will recognize this old, old idea of the actor and the witness. But anyway, I can't think of the name of, of the, the witness guy. But so they wind up, the two of them, in the ashes after the world has burned up. And um, all there is is ashes and they're starving. There's no food. And Ikanchu starts kicking around in the, in the ashes to see if he can kick up anything they can eat. And what he kicks up is a, uh, a, a burnt piece of charcoal, part of a chi, tree that was burnt to charcoal. And so he's holding this charcoal standing in the ashes of the world. And he realizes he can't really eat the charcoal, but he knows it came from a tree. And then he remembers that drums come from trees too. So it occurs to him, maybe this piece of charcoal could be a drum. So he starts to play it like it's a drum. And he gets so intrigued with the rhythm he's playing, he starts to dance. So now he's dash, dancing in the ashes after the incineration of the world. And for a while, that's good enough entertainment. He falls asleep in the ashes. He wakes up in the morning and he's still in the ashes, but he's looking around and he sees there's his piece of charcoal. He looks for his little drum. But he notices coming out of the charcoal is a green tendril. New life in a green tendril coming out of the burned out remnant of a tree. So he understands what's happening. He goes and gets the charcoal and begins to play the rhythm on the charcoal and dance. And now he adds singing. And so now he's singing, dancing, and playing his charcoal drum in the ashes of the incinerated world. And as he does that, the tendril continues to grow. And soon enough, it grows into a tree. And he puts it down and now the tree is rooted in the ashes of the previous world. Um, and so now the tree of life essentially has come back because of him dancing, because of him singing instead of lamenting, instead of giving up or whatever else might happen. Um, anyway, from there, the tree of life gives birth again to all the forests, to all the plants, to all the animals and the humans come back to and the whole world starts over. So there's a myth coming right out of your mention of dancing in the midst of the calamity. Yeah, please keep them flowing. If any others tend to arise over the next little while, please feel free to just let them flow because this is so, so beautiful um, to hear. What comes to mind for me is I just, I've got a picture of you on the djembe back in the day. I saw a video a little while ago and you were, you were sharing stories while drumming yeah. And also what's coming up is this idea of, you mentioned lamenting, but it's almost like um, not falling prey to the fear, almost using it as a signal and, and enlightening a sense of love within or lighting a sense of love, the flame of love, and moving into that feeling and whatever expression calls to you. So whether that's dancing or painting or, you know, you know sharing time with a loved one, whatever that may be, whatever your calling is. Would you be exactly. able to, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know if that's what you did when you were playing these songs on the djembe and sharing stories and how that combination came to be. Okay. So um, I still play djembe, but I, I don't do it on Zoom. Zoom doesn't like drumming. Uh, <laughs> the, the rhythm doesn't work. It's too, it's actually too strong for Zoom. So, so I've learned to present without, uh, without playing drums, but it's really interesting what happened because I was a young father a long time ago. I was a young father 
my first child, my daughter had been born. Turned out she was sick. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. And so she couldn't keep food. She couldn't keep food down and digest it. So she was kind of disappearing. And I spent a lot of time holding her. And when I held her, I, I was studying at the time ethnic musicality. And so I would be playing music from all different places in the world. Uh, she, to this day, loves music from anywhere in the world. Uh, but that was my way of nurturing her when she couldn't take nourishment in. Mm -hmm. But it was also my way of keeping myself present because it was overwhelming to have be a young father and think my, my child might die and, and no, no one's helping. But uh, so I took care of her a lot. One night though, I had a break and I went out walking and I was walking with the weight of realizing that uh, ha having just contributed to a new life in the world, I might lose that. I was really overwhelmed. That was, and so I'm walking down the street in this university district and I hear rhythm music coming from behind a closed down storefront. And because I'm studying ethnomusicality, I recognize that it's the music from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And I go over and the door is slightly cracked open and I slip in and here's this uh, African teacher teaching a bunch of local people uh, how to play marimbas and, and, and how to play the music from actually Shona music from Zimbabwe. And I'm standing there with my broken heart but I'm affected by the music. And he comes over and says, listen, if you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. If you can count, you can play an instrument. Which one are you gonna do? Cause everyone here has to play. So the next thing is a drummer. Next thing I'm drumming, that's how I got into drumming. And I spent the whole night there drumming with my broken heart and my fears and my sorrow. And I left there with a whole different sense of being alive in the midst of a potential tragedy. So that was my introdu introduction to drumming. And, and so just to fine tune it a little further. So then a couple of years pass and I'm playing drums at home once. And I'm thinking about a story that I learned or read, I think, but it was broken. Stories get messed with just the way culture gets messed with. What do you mean by that? So if you imagine, uh, let's just take Europe. Um, so the stories that wind up being considered part of, of the human uh, European heritage, like fairy tales and, and some folk tales, um, often have gone through the hands of, of uh, religious clerics and stuff. And they change them. They change the wording. They change the, they take parts out that are disturbing. Because stories are, are wild. There's stories about everything. Mm. And, 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 and there is no censoring of stories. Everything has to happen in the story, that ha in the story world. And so they take out things that are offensive to the doctrine or whatever it is, the sensibility. And so I have this great story, but there's something missing. I know that. I know it's broken. And, I'm, and I have that going on in my mind when I happen to start playing a drum. And all of a sudden, that story came into view like a film. Like not, not just a film, it's like I'm walking in the story. And as long as I'm playing the drum, the story is there, like this living vision. It was astounding. I mean, I had no idea what was happening, but also I could see what was wrong with the story quite specifically. And I had an imagination of how to fix the story. So in that one moment that was seemed accidental, I learned um, about how imagination active imagination, you would call it nowadays, can get triggered by telling a story. And how, and ever since then, so I don't rehearse stories. I, you know, I never have rehearsed stories uh, because each time it's slightly different because it's coming from an awakened vision of that story. And so each time I'm telling a story, the words come out differently because I'm in a different place. The audience has changed, the world has changed. And I learned on that occasion the, this process of spontaneous storytelling. I know the shape of the story, but the words are gonna change. And so I started telling stories that way. And I, did, I thought I had just stumbled into something, maybe even invented it. And then over time I found out that's what the griots in Africa do. That's what the Shanakis in Ireland do. That's what the shamans in, in Siberia do. They all use drums as vehicles to activate the imagination and the telling of the story was not by rote 
but by being present fully in the rhythm of the moment. Yeah. It, it sounds like that's kind of like you, you're kind of Iconche in the story in a way. And that, that sprout came out in that moment and it continues yes. to come out every moment that you decide to dance. Good interpretation. All right. One more turn on it to show how this stuff goes. So then uh, I work on dreams and I have the habit for 40 some odd years of writing dreams down almost mm. every day. And I'm noticing I'm having a series of dreams where in the dream I'm playing a drum, but it's solid wood. And I, it's really hard to play solid wood and it's hard to get the sound out of it. And I'm in pain, but I keep playing. And then I have a series of the dreams. So eventually the dream becomes burnt wood. And I'm actually in my dream playing burnt wood. And I remember, didn't I read a myth about that somewhere in South America? And I have to then go searching and searching until I can find that story. And, and then I realize the dream was telling me to go find that story because that's one of the stories for understanding what's happening in the world. And so, so there's, I don't even what do you make out of that? So in, in a sense, then I'm playing a drum as it was being invented in this ancient myth with that in, in my current dream. So, I mean, in, in Australia, they'd say, well, you slipped into the dream time where the past can be the present and the future could be the present too. So that whole thing about drumming and like you say, the sprout coming out uh, became a mythology of how I wound up uh, being a storyteller. Mm. Yeah. I'm just thinking of a river right now and you kind of flowing with that river instead of kind of getting in the way. And that's what's kind of needed for you to, to keep opening into this story. And I'm also thinking of how, when we reflect back how memory changes and stories tend to shift a little bit and the imagination has this kind of present, uh, sorry, this kind of quality as well of, you know, just emerging spontaneously in its own way. And it's not really something that can be forced or controlled. Um, we can sit down to imagine, but we can't, you know, plan what we, what's going to come up. And it seems like that's kind of happening on a collective level as well. Like, there's a sense of this ever emergent quality. And for me, the question comes up as to how are we going to dance to that tune and how, we, how are we going to find a way to listen to it first off? Um, because we're, we're immersed in it on one level, but I think we're kind of, even though the veils are opening, there seems to be um, a path that we've been trotting for a certain amount of time that is still... Um, in the realm of the kind of unconscious. So the curiosity comes up there. And I mean, dreams are certainly a, a channel in for sure. A couple of things. One is you had another good image, which is the river. Mm -hmm. So it turns out what I had to figure out what was going on. What did I learn when I was playing the drum and it turned into this visual imaginative experience? I had to have some understanding of it. Um, and so I continued to do it. And so now I was going around telling stories, having no idea what the words were. Total trust has to happen. But then when I reflected on what was going on, there were two rivers inside. One was the river of memory, uh, where I rem I'm remembering the story that I had learned, but I'm not reciting it, I'm remembering it. And by the way, the word remember comes from the old Greek word nemesine, Nemesini is the goddess of the river, of a river. And so, so memory is a river. And uh, so one of the things coming through in the storytelling, spontaneous storytelling, was the river of memory. So that the story is there in this kind of uh, flow of memory. But there's another stream coming or river, which is spontaneous speech. So I realized what I had stumbled into was being using the rhythm to get centered in a space where these two rivers could happen at the same time and then trusting it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a, another way of understanding art also um, because, you know, in a sense, that was an art experience. Um, so then I want to go back to your image of dancing. And so um, if we take Ikanchu as our model, 
for dancing in the midst of the ashes and the disaster and the collapse and the tragedy and the loss, um, then what, is, what could that mean? And so the old understanding of dancing, two, two ideas about it. One is dancing is another way of saying ritual. So um, I have a good friend who's a Latino poet who went to, to research his um, ancestry down in Southern Mexico. And he, you know, his mother was uh, from the Rala Muli people down in Southern Mexico. And he went and visited them. And it turns out they're some of the poorest people on earth. And they have very poor uh, uh, earth for growing things and they live in caves. And uh, he said they actually have so little to eat that they mix uh, earth, dirt, in with the flour to make the tortillas. So they're eating dirt some of the time. He said, but they have a saying, which is really compelling to him. He said, he's sitting there in caves where pe people are practically starving. And their saying is dance or die, dance or die. That's mm -hmm. their saying. And, um, and what they mean is, be in the dance of life. Uh, and on one hand, they mean be in the rituals that keep life going. But on the other hand, it means find your way of dancing yourself into life. So that the second idea, first idea is be in the dance. Native American tribes used to call it the great dance, the thing we're doing, the road of life and death, the great dance. But so that's the big story. The specific story is how do you, how do I, how does each person find their own dance? And that's connected with the old idea that when a person is really dancing, they're no longer thinking about how do I look? Am I, am I cool? Am I doing it pretty well? Watch this. They've, that's all gone. That's all the ego stuff. That's gone. Uh, no longer considering what am I doing, but so fully doing it that the dance is dancing the person. And the idea was when you're dancing from the inside out, then what, hap what you're doing is you're fully being yourself. So to dance meant to be yourself, to become yourself through the process of uh, revelation by being in the creative mode. So I'm just taking your sense of dance, like how do you dance in the middle of all this? And, and extracting the meaning, which is you become more yourself and you're more in the dance of life and you're also more able to contribute to sustaining the dance of life when many things are dying. Yeah. We came here to be ourselves. We have no real alternative. Oscar Wilde said, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. We're here to be ourselves. And that allows us to contribute to the dance of life when most people think it's all coming to an end. I had an experience recently when I found out, I found out that I, I, you know, you think you're being yourself sometimes and there's that's in itself is a process and there's layers to that. And I almost discovered the space between the end of one layer and the beginning of another. And I was very intrigued by that because I realized I was looking at my own thoughts and I realized I, it actually came to me in a river <laughs> when I was considering kind of just taking my clothes off and being naked in this river. And I was almost like I had thoughts come up, you know, what if someone pops around the corner and sees me or, you know, what, what am I like? I was worrying about what other people would think of me instead of just flowing like that river and just kind of being in that moment. And it made me realize, it almost like made me fall to tears because that feeling was probably always there, but I hadn't recognized it. And in some way, it was a, it was a mask of sorts. And that was stopping me from being as close as I probably could to my authentic self. And it's, it just really fascinated me, this whole idea. So it's interesting we're speaking about rivers now and this idea of being ourselves because all this is kind of, um, yeah, quite actually fresh for me. And it was a, my, probably my most recent kind of exploration into that space. So it's, it's fascinating this is coming up. Um, any thoughts on that would be most welcome. But also, I'm kind of curious about this goddess of the river. I'd love to hear more. 
Whoa, okay, so there's a lot there. So it turns out that um, rivers are essentially mythological, right? Think of India, the Ganges River, Mother Ganga. It's mm. the great mother, that's that river. The other famous river is Saraswati, which, who is the goddess of music and all instruments and poetry. And so they're, what they're doing, what they used to do, especially in India, they're amazing. They make the myth part of everybody's life. So everybody knows it's the river Ganga and everybody knows that that's your mother. And most of them know that the river came crashing over great Shiva's head and so on and so forth. So they know the river doesn't come from the mountain, it comes from the divine. So the river that is the physical river is also the divine river, which gives birth to life over and over again, which is what um, the ritual of baptism is about. And that's why they're always going in the river because the river is the river of life. Just the way each child is born from the breaking of the waters inside the ocean of the womb of the mother. And so, so then we all came from the river that came from the ocean in the womb of our mother, which is a model of the whole big thing. Uh, and so baptism was, is not a Christian thing. The Christians got it from African tribes and the African tribes uh, would do baptism not once, but every time you forgot who you were, you could go back mm -hmm. in the water and find out. Um, and so your attraction to be naked in the river is actually like a call to go back into the river of the womb or the river of birth. Um, and so in the African tradition, a person has a big loss or they make a big mistake, something goes wrong, then is disoriented and people would take them down and baptize them again to get them back. It's not, so the idea of being reborn, which meant it to go into the water and be reborn, but what it really means is to go back to the potentials at the beginning of life when we first entered the world on the flow of the waters of the womb. And so when we make mistakes and when we have great losses, we also lose our connection to our potentials, our gifts, the thing we came here to dance with. And baptism was a way of going into the river, into the river of the divine mother, if you wanna call it that, and get in touch with the essence and the origin and the potential of our lives. And so whole villages, when something went wrong, would all go down and baptize each other. Um, and so, you know, your attraction to that is quite meaningful. Um, and the thoughts coming in that maybe I shouldn't do this, what happens, that's what I call received ideas. Mm. We've received all kinds of ideas that interfere with our instinct and our intuitive ways of being ourself. But um, so you can go on and on with rivers. Um, uh, so one more idea for about rhythm. So you decide to go into the river you know, naked, the hell with them, who cares? <laughs> you know, this is more important than what they're thinking. I'm trying to get connected to myself or even to nature or whatever we're gonna call it, the origin of life. So then here's an interesting idea. Time is a river. And so that's why they say you can never enter the same river twice because the river's flowing, time is going by. But once you're in the river of time, um, you can, look back where the past is sending things down the river to you. But strangely, you can also look forward and catch things that are bouncing off the river of the future. And so that's connected to the word prophecy. And prophecy doesn't mean to predict the future. It means to be standing in such a deep place that you get gifts from the past and glimpses of the future. A prophet is not a predictor simply. A prophet is actually someone who's in touch with the ancient stream of knowledge and wisdom. And by staying in touch with that, get glimpses of the future. So that's just part of, you can go on and on. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of words are misinterpreted or misunderstood. Oh yeah. But you mentioned well, already apocalypse simplify. and prophecy. People simplify. Yeah. And, and, and people get excited by 
um, the glittery things like, oh, predict the future. Um, mm. But the ancient or the old statement was you can only go as far forward as you can reach back. So everybody that's leaning too much in the future is just getting unbalanced. The balance of the present is a combination of being in touch with the past and allowing uh, the future to present itself. Mm. So. Mm. so what I'm hearing is getting in touch with and allowing. Yeah, and when everything's falling apart, as you said, right at the beginning, you can go online and get all the mythologies of the world. Years ago, when I, when I was studying mythology on my own without any guidance, I was in a lot of libraries and a lot of used bookstores trying to find all these books. I still have them, uh, you know, mostly ignored, forgotten, strange books about myths of small tribes and so on like that. That same stuff is online now for the most part. So when the structures are collapsing, knowledge becomes more available in a certain way. And, and this is a radical idea, but I've been led to this, you know, in recent years. Um, when things are collapsing, the future is sending us, when things are collapsing, more messages about the future be become available. When people say, I don't know what's coming next, that's when your dream will send you some pretty good images about what might be coming next. And I've found stories, uh, you know, ancient stories, where people practice standing in the unknown because the known world was disappearing. And so um, this idea of standing in the river and not trying to predict the future, but actually getting glimpses of the future is a real thing right now. Yeah, it's just, it just seems to be a quite an uncomfortable space to step into and an unusual one, obviously. <laughs> well, for Western culture. Yes. Because Western culture is all about logic and planning the next step. And everybody has their strategic plan. Well, how's your strategic plan doing with COVID? How's your strategic plan doing with worldwide climate crisis? This is not the time necessarily for strategic planning, but very difficult thing for the Western world and the Western mind to actually stop and say, I don't know don't know, don't know what's really going on, don't know what's coming next, don't know. And yet that's the moment of beginner's mind. <laughs> Stopping and beginner's mind occurs. But I've found in stories, these stories where the people actually stop and they stand in the darkness. And in mythological stories, suddenly, a spirit talks to them or God talks to them or something. You can call it whatever you want. The ancestors talk to them. And so in the periods when the structures are collapsed or they loosen, everything's more permeable. And yeah, everything's more falling apart, but everything's more possible at the same time. Mm. Mythologically. Mm. I'm Getting an arising curiosity, I know it might be a bit off topic. <laughs> I'm kind of curious to know what's going on behind you. I've seen this whole bookshelf of amazing books and this, it looks to be maybe an urn and this beautiful painting on, and the statue. Is, does anything come to mind that you might want to share that may be in any way connected to what we're talking about? Well, what you're referring to as a painting is a tanka. And so Tanka is a traditional um, mythological, spiritual work of art that were typically created for rituals. I mean, now you can get, there, there are Tankas that are considered uh, more like works of art and, they, and they're intended to be around for a long time. But the oldest ones that I could find were, at, were actually thrown away after the ritual. And so I got some Tankas that were throwaway tankas wow. because someone uh, painted on silk and, and made this elaborate thing just the way uh, in the Russian Orthodox monasteries, they'll do those paintings with the, of the saints or the, 
or the, you know, yeah, the saints or Jesus or Mary or somebody with the glowing uh, uh, halo around them, uh, well, that would be done in a ritual and for a ritual. And the person would, would be fasting and going through all these steps of ritual as they did the painting, very similar to in Tibet where Tankas are, are traditionally from, uh, they would make these, um, usually on silk type material, these representations of divine figures that would be like the veil and the divine is coming through that veil and it would be used for a ritual. And so I'm trying to remember what might be behind me. Um, <laughs> is it a green Tara maybe? Uh, but anyway, it's one of these uh, deities of uh, like a bodhisattva mm. would be an, uh, an example. And then below that is a statue that's actually similar of a bodhisattva figure standing like that. I like the image of bodhisattva. Me too. It's, yeah. it's the origin image of Buddha. The bodhisattva is an ancient reference to a series of deities that appear as male and female. Um, that eventually become codified as the Buddha, the way it's now known. Um, and what I like about Bodhisattva is their, um, the story about them is they're beings who become enlightened, but rather than become enlightened and depart for heaven or some other sphere, they return to the world knowing that most people are not enlightened and they return to the world to help other people find their way. That's to me, the core of the Bodhisattva. And I think, or I try to say lately, we're in Bodhisattva times. Like there's many traditions and even practices where people imagine themselves leaving the earth with all its problems for higher spheres. Christians go to heaven, so do people, Muslims do too. And, you know, that's not what we need right now. The earth is in trouble now. The earth needs prayer, attention, practice, relation, connection. So I call it Bodhisattva times. Whatever we know or might know, our little phase of enlightenment, the thing now is to bring it back to the earth, bring our gifts and our experiences, bring our prayers and our intentions to the earth. Because we're living in a time now where the actual home, very close to the word om, the actual home is in danger. And so it seems to me that the proper spiritual practices now um, would be best used to help heal the planet, as people say and help reconnect human culture to nature. It's quite so interesting. I have, so I have that hanging there. Yeah. It's interesting Reminder. that you do though, because if you think about it, they've put it together in a ritualistic way, like you mentioned through fasting and certain intentions for this specific ritual as well. And then it seems like there's a clear link between um, almost like you, we mentioned earlier, how we began all this around coming into our own form of expression for the benefit of all like a bodhisattva and then um rituals being almost like a path to do that bringing meaning into our own lives and then that connecting back to the whole um so it's interesting that you've you know that's kind of how this was created and now it's hanging behind you and now we're kind of having this chat well it's interesting also another thing in the um kind of struggles of the Western world, mm. people forget that the origins of all arts were service to the divine. Mm. Th that was art. Art wasn't, I mean, you could always have the level of art, which is beautification, you know, making the, the, the home or the area beautiful, which is really meaningful. Beauty is not a superficial thing. Beauty is a resonance of the soul. So that's great. But all of the art and all of the artists used to be in service of the divine. There wasn't a music industry. It's really a kind of contradiction in terms. The word music comes from muse. 
The muses are, you know, kind of spirit energies that hang around mountains and show up in dreams and inspire people to do creative things. And so then they don't spawn an industry. That's not what they were up to. They're up to getting people connected to creation. And so all of the arts were a return to creation and all of them were connected to the divine. So I know I love music. I have a lot of musician friends and, and, I, and I always remind them music is the healing path. Music is about receiving inspiration from the unseen and applying it in some, through some instruments or the voice as an instrument and using that for the process of healing and reconnecting the human to the divine. And the same thing is true with visual arts. Uh, they weren't there simply to uh, benefit the galleries and museums. They were there to create this kind of penetrable veil that would attract the unseen or the eternal on one side to the human on the other side. And, and that is an example of that. The and people making that knew that. It was let go of as well towards the end like of the what? ritual. It was let go of. So there's, like you mentioned, they probably let go of it after the ritual and that's at how the, you... Yeah. yeah. It, at, in that ancient tradition, when the ritual was over, everything would be removed. And the only people will, would have ever seen it were the people at the ritual. Mm -hmm. We do that when we do ritual stuff. That's what we do. But yeah, but and that meant that beautiful things would be disposed of. Mm -hmm. as, so as not to get stuck on the literal level and realize that when we want to be present again, we have to start again and create things of beauty to bring ourselves present. Mm -hmm. So so that the um, it didn't necessarily lead to building cathedrals that it was actually more connected to nature and nature is the bountiful representative representation of creation ongoing and nature is casting off what it creates all the time. Nature just reach creates. It doesn't hold on to it and say, here's this tree. Everybody got help this tree. You know, I mean, there were very old trees and that's fantastic, but, uh, but nature's basic mode is life, death, renewal. Yes. And that was the road, of, the mode of ritual too. It was the mode of art. And even to this day, someone paints something and they have to let it go. It could wind up in the house of someone they don't relate to at all. You have to let it go. And even music that we make, really, you can try to hold on to it, but really you have to let it go. And if someone gets in a creative mode that's natural to their soul, that's what's going to happen. I mean, how many love songs have been written, but they all have to be rewritten because the river has changed, the world has changed, and the people have changed. So the artists were part of that remaking, recreating, and, and, and doing each time uh, the dance of trying to connect to the divine. Mm. That can come back. That's an awareness that could come back. Hmm. I'm just kind of taking in what you're saying while at the same time, well, I've got this one more point of exploration that I, I really didn't want to miss out on chatting about. <laughs> and I'm cognizant of time in this, in this kind of river that we're in at the moment. <laughs> I was wondering if you might be open to diving into uh, it seems to be something you're really well versed in is initiations and this idea of the collective initiation I find quite fascinating, but I'm also looking at it from a perspective of um, almost like uh, creatively putting together rituals of initiation and how one might go about doing that for either themselves or their children or um, you know, to, to enliven that energy within their life in some way. And I'd love to hear your kind of thoughts or whatever comes up in your heart or mind around that. So initiation um, is a reference to um, revelation in a sense, not, not religious revelation, but one of the old meanings of initiation is to reveal oneself to oneself. So um, in all the old mythologies, 
each soul that is born is gifted. Everyone that comes into the world is gifted. I call it genius. Everyone has some genius. And so, but then you're born into a family and the family doesn't even know who you are. I mean, they say you look like your father or your grandfather, but that's as close as they can get uh, because the family didn't give birth to the spirit of the child, to the soul of the child, to the genius of the child. And so there's something mm -hmm. inside the child that is uniquely that child's. But the child, like all American, uh, American, like all human um, beings, is deeply dependent. Humans are the most dependent beings when they're born. And so you go through this long period of being dependent on mom and dad and the family and the village and the culture. Um, that's called childhood. And it's usually a mixture of glorious things and really devastating things. At least that's how it usually goes. And then it comes to an end. Um, and nowadays they have these great, really good studies of developmental process. They know what's going on in the development of the child. And that lasts up to about 11 or 12 years old. And after that, development, developmental theory doesn't apply. Something else happens. Childhood comes to an end. And what was a developmental, biological, somewhat predictable process now changes, but not incrementally, a leap has to occur. From the end of childhood, which could be seen as a death, leaping from a dependency of childhood into the rest of one's life. And that moment of transition um, can be called rites of passage or initiation, they're different words for the same thing. And people traditionally understood that when the child, when the period of child is over, um, the person going through the radical change can't handle it all on their own. They have to be reborn, but not in the familial way. They have to re be reborn to independence, not dependence. And so they knew this was psychologically, we call it psychologically now, a really important transition. And so humans began to experiment with initiatory process in order to help the child awaken to who they are inside, um, distinct from family and distinct from culture because initiation rites were done in nature, not in the village, but in the bush. And so what that meant, so then here's a, a nice image for that, that so girls and boys would go through initiation because the boats were supposed to become full awakened versions of themselves. And so um, the move of initiation was one way it was described was moving from the lap of the personal mother to the lap of the great mother, mm -hmm. to the lap of nature or the Ganges River, or whatever image you want to use. It was supposed to be this awakening to this much bigger life and an understanding that human nature is secretly, intimately connected to great nature. And that the rest of a person's life was going to be more like nature. And the mystery of nature is birth, death, renewal. And so initiation rites enacted a death and then a period of not knowing, liminality is the fancy term for it, a period of betwixt and between that can be a mixture of challenges and ordeals and awakenings through which the person who was a child becomes aware of who they're supposed to be. So when initiation is done in a healthy manner, there's actually two things that happen. One is the person realizes uh, who they are at their essence. The person has an awakening, a genuine awakening. I mean, we were talking about the moment where suddenly I started seeing stories while I was drumming. That was an initiation. If, if that had happened in a different era or it happened in a traditional culture in Africa or Ireland or Siberia, people would have been there that knew what was going on and saying, oh, this guy, Look at that, he's going on that road, mm -hmm. not because he wanted to, but because it's happening to him. Something of his nature, of nature is coming through. So uh, people had a better understanding of that. 
So one part of it would be a revelation of who the person was. And then the other part of it would be a healing because since the human family doesn't know the nature of their own child, is not even supposed to. They're supposed to love, protect, and care for that child. But the essence of the child is a mystery to them naturally. Um, and so things go wrong. Everyone, if the human family could give the child everything they needed, everybody would just stay home. Everybody would stay children. It never works out. There's always something that goes awry. There's trauma. There's mis misunderstandings and so on. And so in order to step from childhood with its innocence and its traumas into the rest of one's life, there needs to be this awakening and realization on one side and a healing of things that have already been wounding and traumatizing on the other side. And so the middle ground, death of the child, letting go of the previous phase of life, stepping into the unknown, and then ordeals and challenges through which the two things happen, revelation of what's inside the person on one hand and healing of what's traumatizing the person on the other hand. And now the person is being initiated into their life. And the rest of their life, you could say, will be a further revelation of who they really are. And that requires continuous healing as well. And so that's why they'd say, once you have initiation, it's you are on the initiatory path for the rest of your life. That life is about awakening and healing. Um, and then there's one more phase after the middle ground of awakening, healing, ordeal, challenge, um, then there's a return to the human community. And so in traditional cultures, whoever it was, the girl or boy, would eventually come back and the whole village would be waiting for them. Mm. And very classic thing, what everybody would sing to them. And so they would be sung back into the human community. And, uh, and it was understood that um, the initiation of one person had an effect on the whole community. Um, and so, so now what happens is you can't get rid of this stuff. It's archetypal. That's what Carl Jung would say. And it, it, initiation is an archetypal process. So what happens is people leave home, but without the rite of passage, and they get into initia initiatory trouble anyway. They have ordeals, they have woundings, they have losses. Um, they're in liminal spaces. There's all kinds of confusion. There's some revelations. And people really have unfinished initiations. That's how I think about it. That so most people... Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, what's coming up for me is this, I, I guess there's a confusing element. And I think I'm, I'm trying to work through it. It's this idea of almost something we, we spoke about earlier about in every new moment, we're continuously being reborn and we're dying again. And there's this this always ever going change that's taking place of the emergent story within ourselves and within the collective and what i'm not sure about is you know it seems like what you're saying and correct me if i'm wrong there's the a healthy process because it's built into you know um us on a on an archetypal nature is to go through in these initiations and you know to to like not go back, but come through this, this rite of passage. But it seems like this is going on over and over again. So the question is, you know, how many rites of passage are right and, and at what points are they significant? So you mentioned this moving out of childhood into like a teenager, and I'm sure there's other parts like midlife or maybe when you're older, um, you know, moving into – or into menopause for a woman or something like that. But I'm just kind of curious of how do we know, how do we feel into um, when a rite of passage is being called and um, yeah, like how do we know? Cause, cause of, because just putting that next to the, the idea that we're, we're always kind of going through this change and we're always going through passages of, of sorts. So those are the, but those are the two dynamics. Mm -hmm. So Usually when you speak about rites of passage, you start with youthful initiations mm -hmm. because I think that's how people discovered it. They realized, wait, they're, they're children, but they're not children anymore. And so adolescence and youth is the period where 
you know, you can't tell if, you know, if your own children, are they going to be acting like a kid today or are they acting like a junior adult today? What's going to happen? And, and, and in psychology, it's a problem too. And in education, it's a problem. The things that worked in grade school, you try those with teenagers, you're going to have a hard time because mm-hmm. they, have, they have their own space more. They're trying to reveal themselves. They're trying to get seen. And so that's how it got started, I think. Um, but then archetypally, there's two things that happen. Expected rites of passage, youthful rite of passage, marriage is a rite of passage, um, midlife could be called a rite of passage, uh, elder becoming an elder is a rite of passage, and dying is a rite of passage. Mm. So those are the ones that are expected. But then because it's the psyche, because it's the river of experience, there are the unexpected, unpredicted rites of passage. So we were talking about baptism. When a person finds themselves in trouble, in a descent, falling apart, in a depression, something happens, they've lost, they lost a loved one, death has you know, decimated them, they're in a rite of passage, or they're in, a, they're in, a, in an initiatory moment. And so the archetype can apply in the expected occurrences of life, but it also applies to the unexpected. And so, so then you say, well, on the level of expected initiations, you can predict roughly how many there are, and it ends with death. On the unexpected level, which is where we live now, the great uncertainty of the world, the lack of traditional practices, lack of, lack, lack of rites of passage, we're in the unexpected layer. It can happen at any time. And, and so at that layer, what they say is, oh, you've had an initiation. Well, that qualifies you for an even deeper initiation. <laughs> if you think about revelation, what's being revealed is the deeper and deeper levels of the psyche. And so you have both of those levels. So then, you know, so you can have, people can learn how to do marriage rituals in ways that are, are really connected to initiatory practice. Um, and people can learn that about elders too. It's really a beautiful thing. I'm hoping it makes a comeback. But I think the more important thing is to realize how the unexpected, the informal need for initiation uh, becomes part of what I've been calling a collective rite of passage. If you take the idea that the previous form of life, childhood in the case of the young person, uh, the previous form of life is, is discarded, is, is shed, it's over somehow, and the person steps onto this unknown, unknown new ground, which is the middle phase, which involves descent and challenge and ordeal well that's what we're in the world as we knew it is gone people are clinging to it people are claiming they're going to go back to it but it's gone we're in that middle ground already and so then that that means we're all in initiatory territory initiatory territory right now the big trick in this dynamic is finding ways to bring the initiatory experience to a meaningful finish because that involves the community. The individual can go through all kinds of initiatory experiences, but they're not over until the community is there welcoming us back. Mm -hmm. And the community has to be a conscious community. So we have two problems right now, collectively. One is we have to go through all these initiatory experiences of loss and not knowing and confusion, ordeals, and challenges. And the other is we have to figure out how to create community to welcome ourselves back. On the village, and so, yeah. So we're yeah. in a radical form of collective initiation or rites of passage from my point of view. Good news, there's myths about that. There's stories about that. They're not the stories of the uh, strategic plan they're not the stories of the predictable occasions of life. They're the stories of the radical changes that happen inside, inside myth. 
Are there any particular myths that stand out that you might want to point us towards or any that come up? I'm sure there's a, a whole, you know, river full, <laughs> but I'm just, just curious. Okay. So the problem with myth is it keeps opening up. And I think, sure. and, and myth like ritual will destroy time. And I know we have a time limit, but yep. Yep. so um, let's see, where could we, where could we close it up? Um, What's well, interesting. In Ikanchu, the story I was talking about where the world turns into ashes. So, you know, the fear of global warming, well, this myth takes global warming into incineration mm. and says at the end, when nothing is left, there is secretly something left. And that thing which is burned and darkened is actually where life is hiding. And that thing, which is the last thing you would think of, which is dancing in the middle of disaster is where the vitality is hiding. And so what happens in the rest of that story, because I told part of it, so you could see the elements of initiation. Uh, Ikanchu and Chuna, his partner's name is Chuna. Chuna is the witness to everything. It's very Buddhist, this part of the story. And um, they're the only ones left, not just their childhood is gone, their childhood home is gone. Everybody's home is gone in, in, in uh, mythological language. That means initiation's on. So now they're in the ordeal. There's nothing to eat. They're suffering. It's like the fasting people do in the initiatory process. Um, they're in the place of not knowing. They don't know north, south, east, west because there's nothing to see except ashes. Uh, and so they're clearly in the middle stage. But what happens after Ikanchu gets the dance going and the, and the, the tendril turns into the tree of life and eventually the forest comes back and the animals come back and the people come back. And then what happens is this is the story that they tell every year about why they're alive. They live in the forest and why the forest continues to be alive because it's the story of the renewal, you know, life, death, renewal. And so the tribe that tells the story has their annual event where everybody comes together. And so in the story of Ikanchu, after the tree of life is there, there's no explanation for this. He's kicking around in the ashes again, and he hits something hard. He digs into the ashes and pulls it up and it's a rock. Well, of all things to do, and he throws the rock at the tree of life. Um, it seems uh, counterintuitive and probably politically incorrect, but he throws a rock at the three of life. The rock hits a branch. The branch falls into the ashes and quickly turns into a tree itself. And so he realizes that this thing at the center that has come from the tendril that has come from the charcoal is indestructible. And so he gets rocks and he's throwing it at the tree of life. And each time he hits a branch, it becomes another tree. And that's how the forest comes back. So what the people do in the tribe that have this story, is every year they get together and there's certain trees that bear fruit at, at this time of year. And they all get little rocks and they throw it at the tree and knock the fruit down. And then they get the fruit and they all eat the fruit together. And then they have a big dance because everybody's been reborn and, and, and they're all part of nature and they realize it and they're back in mythic time. So, so we have to learn that kind of stuff. Uh, the world isn't really gonna break. The tree of life is not going to disappear. And we have to learn how to ways to dance, like you mentioned early on. And then we have to learn ways to all dance together so that we can welcome each other into the world that's trying to arrive. And it can only come through the people who are alive at a given time. That's us for now. You so much michael um yeah i just want to reach out and give you a big hug and of appreciation <laughs> thank you so much yeah thank you good to be with you again is there is there any chance of um maybe pointing listeners in the direction of i mean there's going to be links in the show notes that kind of thing um your website or some of the courses that you run are quite um quite extraordinary so if you wanted to just maybe rattle off a few things people could check out to deepen sure. their journey yeah sure thank you yeah so it's uh, mosaic voices, all one word, mosaicvoices.org. Or the other way to find it is through our weekly free podcast, which is called Living Myth. And that'll lead you to the same place. 
And then since we're talking about all this, pretty soon we're about to start a course, which, which is uh, called Lead Into Gold. And, and what it's about is taking the lead, the heaviness, the denseness, the inert qualities of our life, like E. Kanchu with that piece of charcoal and turn it into gold. The alchemy of the soul, the alchemy of uh, initiatory change in the midst of a world uh, turning to ash. <sighs> Thank you so much for sharing your presence with me and for coming on this journey. If you're interested in working one-on-one -on -one with me, head over to todaydreamer.com, see what I may have on offer. And if you're interested at all in checking out some of the other videos, head over to youtube.com forward slash todaydreamer where there'll be more content uh, around cultivating the practice of presence in order to more fully contribute or participate in the blossoming of the emergent world story together. Catch you in the next episode and be well.